So we'll do my CompTIA in 10006 study material. This is chapter 8. We're dealing with wireless LANs or WLANs. In this uh, chapter, we're looking at what's wireless, deploying, and securing Wi-Fi. So how do various wireless LAN technologies function? And what wireless standards are out there? Which one are the more common ones? What are some of the uh, most imper uh, important characteristics when we're talking about wireless LAN design? And what are some of the security risks? What are some of the ones that are currently exist? What are some of the uh, future threats? And how can we take both current and future risks and mitigate them? So first and foremost, two major components when we talk about wireless LANs, we break them up into two major categories, ad hoc and infrastructure LANs. So our ad hoc is a wireless device communicating directly with one another. For example, like if you have an iPhone AirPlay, that's going to be a one-to-one. -one. Uh, there is no centralization. Everyone is kind of just off by themselves. While infrastructure, it's devices communicate with one another through some type of centralized access points. We also have what's called a wireless router. In reality, this is just normally a multi-unit. That's a router, wireless access point, switch, firewall, and other items combined. Normally you see this in a small office, home office network. Here's an example of a basic WLAN topology using a Soho router. We have a wireless router, that's also a bridge, that's also a wireless access point. And it's very basic for, very common for small networks. In our wireless router, we have what's called an access point, or AP. This access point interconnects our wired LAN to our wireless LAN. It does not interconnect two networks. It just connects a wired LAN with a wireless LAN. The AP connects to a wired LAN, and then all of the wireless devices gain access to the wireless or through the wired LAN with that wireless connection. For example, we have our wired network down here. This is all our wired network. Now, to gain access to these resources, we have this access point which people will connect wirelessly to to gain access to our wired resources. How do the uh, laptops and other devices connect to that access point? They do so in the form of an antenna. The antenna uh, is going to be depending on a few different things. So the coverage areas vary uh, widely based off of the antenna being used. Factors that can affect the antenna could be its distance, its pattern, its environment, its interference or uh, interface with other uh, access points, its interface with its current access point, and interference with other access points. Normally, antennas come in two flavors, omnial directional and unidirectional. Omnial directional antennas radiate power at relative equal power levels in all directions. Think giant circle. Unidirectional uh, focuses their power in a specific location. So omnial, that's what most uh, networks use. It, everything goes out equally uh, powerful in a giant circle. Unidirectional is more of a point-to-point, -point, like satellite, for example. We also have what's called frequencies and channels. This is a good one. Uh, most often, you hear like 2.4 gigahertz or the 5 gigahertz bands, but what is that? That's the wireless frequency channels that we're allowed to use, or the wireless frequency we're allowed to use, because they're free. We don't have to pay for licensing. So we can use 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz. That there are also steps like 2.401, 2.402, 2.403, and so forth. All of those are known as specific channels. Also, we have a 5 gigahertz band. That's 5.75 gigahertz to 
5.875 gigahertz. So notice we don't have the full 5 gigahertz band, we only have a, a 0.1-ish or 100 megahertz uh, range that we get to play with. Now remember, channels are a specific band within a frequency. Here we have common bands. In America, you need to know three specific channels. Very important. One, six, and 11. We don't use these in the US, like the 14 and above, we don't use those. But we do use one, six, and 11. You'll notice these are the important channels because they don't overlap with one another. They only overlap with like two and three, but never with one, will never overlap with six. Six will never overlap with one or 11. They will always be unique to one another. Here are the frequencies and if they overlap, again, channels you need to know. On Wi-Fi, normally we use one, six, and 11. 14 is not used in the US. On the Network Plus exam, it's very common for you to be given a wireless scenario and for the access points to be misconfigured where they all may be on the same channel or two will be on channel six and one will be channel 11. You need to make sure that they're on channels one, six, or 11. I'm gonna show a slide a little bit later that will show you the layout if we have multiple access points and how we do that. So the mechanism that controls access to Wi-Fi is CSMA, CA, collision avoidance, which is different from Ethernet CSMA collision detection. In CSMA, a wireless device listens for a transmission on a wireless channel to determine whether it's safe to transmit if the channel is clear, it transmits. Very similar to a wired network. The collision avoidance mechanisms differ though. With CA, a transmitting device notices other wireless devices that is ready to send and it waits for acknowledgements. If it does not receive an acknowledgement, it starts the random back of time, tries again. So it tries the wait. And then if it doesn't get an acknowledgement, it waits a little bit longer and it keeps waiting. Different ways that we can do transmission methods is because wireless standards and technologies are constantly changing. Certain types of spread spectrum technology that you should be aware of are things like direct sequence spread spectrum, frequency hopping, spread spectrum and orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. These are some of the transmission methods that are really important to understand. So some common ones is OFDM It is a frequency division multiplexing. It sends signals using multiple frequencies to the destination, whereas DSSS uses the entire frequency or a single frequency to the destination. So OFDM allows better throughput with multiple frequencies and it need not uh, have direct line of sight where DSS is lower throughput using a single frequency to transmit data and it doesn't need direct line of sight either. Also, DSS it modulates by a uh, PN code and essentially it does different variations where the FHSS, the frequency hopping, the RF carrier frequency is changed according to the PN sequence. The sequence is known to both the transmitter and the receiver, hence helping the modulation, demodulation process within the chips. Essentially, 
there are two types of uh, FHSS, slow and fast. It ties back to how much of the frequency can we use and what's going to be better. Normally DSSS is really good to point to point while frequency hopping is used to point to multipoint. That's the big thing here. So what does that mean in terms of our wireless standards? So in this chapter, what you want to know is you want to know the standards, the band, and the bandwidth. Those are commonly asked questions. Like 802.11, the base technology, it uses 2.4 gigahertz, and its maximum bandwidth is 2-ish megabits per second. The next standard after that was 802.11a, that uses 5 gigahertz. It allowed for 54 megabits per second. And you'll notice it uses the division multiplexing. Our first common Wi-Fi standard was 802.11b, using the 2.4 gigahertz range. You'll notice we have a slower speed at 11 megabits per second. Even though A came out first, then we actually digressed speeds. Then we had 802.11G, also at 2.4 gigahertz, and we could transmit at 54 megabits. Later came 802.11N, which that uses both or 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And this is roughly between 100 and 300 megabits, depending on how you set it up. And we have our current wireless standard, 802.11ac, that uses 5 gigahertz. And again, is pretty dang fast. You're looking at speeds of upwards of 5 gigabits per second, if not at least 500 megabits per second. And distances. Distances are very subjective. They are based off of uh, optimal settings, but realistically, again, we're looking at environment, weather, all kinds of things that may affect this range. All right, so deploying wireless LANs. We have three main categories of wireless LANs, and we have an independent basic service set, IBSS. This is also used for ad hoc. Again, no access points, just wireless devices. We have a BSS, or basic service set. This is our typical wireless LAN with one access point. Or we can have an extended service set, and that allows for multiple access points. An example of our IBSS, everything is more like point to point. Everything is more decentralized for wireless devices. Our basic service set, BSS, is just one access point and everything connects to it. If you have a small facility, that may work. But if you have a larger facility, you may need this ESS, which will be multiple access points. And normally, you want this type of setting so that the wireless is converged, meaning the wireless network is all the same. So you don't end up with like Wi-Fi North, Wi-Fi South, Wi-Fi East, all for the same building. That's improper wireless design, but sadly it's out there. So let's look at interference. What can cause interference? This is gonna be RFI, radio frequency interference. And it could be caused by other devices, similar frequencies, similar channels, it uh, could be caused by other uh, wireless devices, things like cordless phones, baby monitors, ovens, microwave ovens, security systems, um, wireless cameras, maybe physical obstacles, walls, ceilings, people, or it could just be really bad signal strength. So let's go ahead and let's move into this wireless LAN is using more than one access point. So we're doing a ESS wireless LAN. And a big part of this is it re it's going to require planning. So it's going to talk about convergence or coverage. 
And that means you're going to have access points that are going to converge with one another. And their coverage will be all the way through. Meaning, we have some overlap between our channels. That way, if a student happens to be walking that way, it, the, he connects to the Wi-Fi here, he should be able to stay on the same Wi-Fi all the way through. And even when he's away from channel one, away from this access point, the other access points should know about them and allow him to just be picked up on the new access points without having to reconnect. That's what I mean by converged. All of the access points know about one another and they work together. What happens if we need to add a fourth access point here? Like over here, for example, maybe this will use channel number one. A little bit better example, you'll never see them overlapping. Like this one will be one. This one will also be one. The one right here, maybe six. You will always see the number separated. You use one, six, and 11, and you just keep repeating these numbers. So let's go ahead and move into security. So if you do not properly install your access points and routers with some type of an equivalent to a the same level of security that you would, uh, would with ports, you can have access to your wireless network through your access points. Normally, people will actually try to do free Wi-Fi by doing what's called war driving, driving around, looking for open or unsecured Wi-Fi for them to gain access to. Other security issues could be things, something like a, a war chalking, and this is basically once an open wireless is found in a public place, a user will write a symbol on a wall to notify other users. Forms of encryption could be things like WEP and WPA security. These are things that will uh, easily be broken if you have the correct tools. So this is actually called uh, SRACking. If we're looking to how to break WEP and WPA, and essentially, you can, you can run a math, a math algorithm against the captured uh, wireless information. So you can actually break into the uh, Wi-Fi to get its pre-shared key so you can use their access. You can also set up rogue access points. Basically, if you already have Wi-Fi for your network, you can actually manipulate it by adding an additional access point that's not supposed to be there that has less security. That's gonna be known as a rogue access. Some war chalking symbols could be a, an open node, could be a closed node, could be web. Those are just some of the common field uh, items that are put out there. This one, not so much uh, needing to know as important as other things like the Wi-Fi channels. I don't think I've ever seen war chalking symbols on a exam approaches to our wireless security could be things like mac address filtering meaning we can filter what macs are allowed to access the access point by applying mac address filtering that's more cumbersome because then you have to have a list of all the permitted mac addresses and if you have lots of laptops and lots of mobile users it's a lot more overhead another thing that you can do is disabling the SID, SSID, the name of the Wi-Fi, so it doesn't broadcast, meaning the name won't show up if people try joining it. So if you uh, try to find a, a Wi-Fi, if you don't have it pre-configured, it won't connect. Other approaches could be something like a pre-shared key, or my favorite, is IEEE's 802.1x, and this is gonna be for authentication with someone's own credentials. Very similar to like port authentication. Normally with this, you're gonna be setting up a radius server or some type of authentication server. 
verify that end users have the appropriate access to access that wireless resource. So how does that work? You connect to a wireless controller and then you basically you send the key and it tries to verify that you are you. Then the authentication server will allow a key distribution to be sent to you. And if it really is you, the data is then secured and you can then process or uh, use that access point to send network uh, items or network requests. This is a dumbed down version of Radius, but essentially it will authenticate you and then authorize you based off of the credential that you provide. Typical wireless standard comes in three common flavors, WEP, WPA, and WPA version two. Each have their own weaknesses, each have their own strengths. Realistically, WPA2 is going to be what you want to use. However, all of these are capable of being broken into using the, a little bit of knowledge and the appropriate wireless hacking tool. WEP originally used in 802.11. It uses a static 40-bit web key and it will use a 24-bit initialization vector key sent in clear text. You can normally compromise this with a brute force attack. A WEP key should take you about five minutes to break, if that. Because it was so easily broken into, they implemented WPA. And this will use a temporary key, uh, integrity protocol, or TKIP. It uses a 48-bit instead of a 24-bit key. It uses message integrity check, MIKC, to confirm that the data wasn't modified in transit. It also has an enterprise mode WPA. And this is gonna, we're gonna work with authentication uh, for key exchanges, some type of radius. And normally this will be used between a client and an access point. There'll be temporary keys, but again, this is a little bit easier to secure. WPA again takes about eight minutes to break into, so we had a, a second version of it. WPA version two implemented uh, for the requirements of the 802.11i standard. It uses counter mode with cipher blocking chaining message authentication code protocol, CCMP. This is what it used for the integrity checking. For the encryption, it uses advanced encryption standards or AES. We're going to get more into this, but normally you want to use WPA2. It may take you 15 minutes to break into, or roughly, but WPA2 by far provides the most security. That's actually the end of this chapter. I want to thank you.